good afternoon. Good to see you again. We are almost finished with this event, uh, but we are going to have a, a great, um, and I hope that a very productive uh, conversation about the challenges that we have in terms of personal rights. Uh, thank you also for the great conversations that we had in the afternoon uh, with Scott Stern, with the speakers that we have uh, just in a moment, because we already saw that there are some issues that need uh, some innovation, some investment, some disruptive actions that can help us uh, to move the needle in social progress. So now we are going to have um, this conversation in a new normality standard. That means, uh, of course, in an hybrid mode. In person, we are going to have here, let me just introduce our speaker. He's here in my notes. I have a lot of data that I want to share with you. Kelsey Mulcahy, she is the Public Policy Research Manager in the Initiative Data for Good from Meta. And please, an applause for her. She's going here to present a lot of good stuff that they are doing. And also on Zoom, I, I think they are doing the connection with Mimi Marciani. She is the president of the Texas Civil Rights Project. There I can see Mimi. Hi, Mimi. We are, we are all seeing you. So welcome to What Works. I suppose you are in Texas. Uh, I am in Austin, Texas, and I'm very sad I'm not there in person. You are missing a great view. Uh, but well, we are going to enjoy the conversation uh, this afternoon. Uh, let me just introduce the, the topic. Um, we are going to talk about personal rights. We are going to talk about this inclusion. By this moment of the event, uh, I suppose that most of you are experts in social progress. Uh, I remember some faces from the workshop. So you remember the framework of SPI, these three dimensions, these 12 components. Uh, one is about basic human needs. The another one is about foundations of well-being. And finally, opportunities. In opportunities, we are measuring the capabilities that we have to reach our full potential as individuals, but also as a society. Uh, we measure personal rights, we measure inclusiveness, personal freedom and choice, and access to advanced education. If you remember from the first day, I told you everything is connected. This is a system. We can have social progress and economic growth if we failed in health and wellness, if we failed in nutrition and basic medical care, if we fail in personal rights. It's connected. And, and I'm going to put you an example uh, that we are suffering in, in the region uh, where I work. Uh, my office is at Incai Business School in Costa Rica. We also have a campus in Nicaragua. And if you remember six years ago, eight years ago, everybody was talking about the miracle of Nicaragua in terms of economic growth. The rate of economic growth of Nicaragua was like 5%, 6% each year. They were talking like, hey, this is a miracle that this country is, is growing so fast. Actually, they say the best tourism now in the region is not in Costa Rica, it's in Nicaragua. And everything seems to work good. Actually, in SPI, you can see that they increase nutrition, basic medical care. They increase water and sanitation. They increase shelter. So they were growing. But suddenly, in 2018, we saw a political crisis. We saw a change in the personal rights. And in the last measurement of Social Progress Index, Nicaragua was a country that has lost more points on personal rights. They have now an economic crisis. They have now candidates for the presidency in jail. So they had elections with only one candidate that actually can win, which is the actual president. We are seeing a loss of investments, a loss of NGOs, foundations, and entrepreneurs that are going outside that country because they don't have the conditions. We are expecting a decline in social progress in Nicaragua in the next years. Uh, so as you can see, something that is political, that it depends of democracy, of freedom, of inclusiveness, is affecting the rest of the components of social progress, and is affecting also economic growth. So you say, well, it's just Nicaragua, but no. If we see the data of the Social Progress Index from the last 10 years, 
Yes, we are seeing great advances in access to information and communication, in health and wellness, in water and sanitation. All those components that have business, that have governments, that require infrastructure, and also that depend on income, are increasing really fast. But those components that are not related to income, but to, to institutional arrangement, to social arrangement, normal and informal institutions, we are not moving forward. Actually, we are going backwards. Personal rights is a component at global level where we are having more lost in, in points during the last 10 years. And practically in all regions around the world, except Oceania, all the regions are losing in terms of personal rights. And this is just a teaser because it's, it's not uh, public and these are preliminary results, but we saw the data from the historical SPI that the research team is calculating. Data from 1990 until this year. And we are seeing that from the first 10, 20, 20 years, we increased personal rights, actually. But in the last decade of this century, we are going backwards. And practically, we are erasing what we won at the beginning of the 90s. So this is affecting uh, practically all the world. Specifically, for example, in the US. Uh, US has a great, a great potential, but also with Nicaragua, it's one of the countries that in the region, in the continent, is decreasing in personal rights. So that's why it's important to talk about this, these challenges. And af again, after seeing the presentation of Professor Scott Stern, well, we see that there is an opportunity of doing something on those components. Uh, maybe we need to think about new technologies, new arrangements, something where innovation can help us to tackle that issue. OK, so I just present what is the context, why this impo is important to talk about this. Everything is connected. And now, uh, let me just start with this, with this conversation. I will start with, with Mimi, because uh, I know that all of you are used to sometimes have problems with uh, technology. In the morning, we have problems with Wi-Fi. Uh, so it's, it's good to know that Right now we are connected, and, and, and let's use that. So Mimi, given your experience, um, and also the work that you are doing in Texas uh, as a lawyer that cares about voting systems, about personal rights, I, I, I want to try to understand what's happening in the United States in respect to the political rights and the health of the democracy of, of that country. Why are we seeing these trends in, in, in social progress index? Well, um, first, uh, thank you to Sophie and to the entire team at SPI for having me, um, especially having me virtually, which, as, as we all know, is not quite as good as being in person. But um, I was really excited to be part of this important conversation for the reasons that you were just raising. Um, the U.S. also has seen a troubling drop in our democracy scores in recent years. And I actually was looking up a statistic I wanted to share a decade ago. Uh, the Freedom House, which is like the leading, um, you know, democracy indexer, uh, arguably in the country, used to give the United States a score of 94 out of 100, putting our democracy alongside France and Germany. And today we've fallen to a score of 83, meaning that we're closer to Croatia and Panama and countries that typically the U.S. does not think about its democracy being side by side with. And um, there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, the, the top lines are that we've seen a spike in, um, it kind of started, I think, with an increase in partisanship, but it has morphed into political extremism, which has gone into political violence, it was actually the reason that the U.S., uh, for the first time in our history, almost did not pass the very first test of being a democracy, which is the peaceful transfer of power after the two, um, 2020 presidential election. We've also seen an increase, and this is a lot of the work that I do day in and day out, unfortunately, in Texas. We've seen an increase in the intentional manipulation and suppression of voting. So this looks like drawing district lines to make it more difficult for communities to elect who they want and making it more difficult for particular communities to get to the polls. Uh, we've also seen misinformation, which, of course, is a problem that affects all sorts of um, sectors in our current age, 
but misinformation has been used by as a political tool and as a tool to um, um, to keep power. And then all of that has been alongside and, and has further contributed to what I like to call a perversion of our the checks and balances, especially at the national level where we have seen institutions like the US Senate um, <laughs> almost fail to be able to function because they have given so much power to a small minority in that body. So all of those trends have been um, coming together and, and the unfortunate result is this weakening of our democracy that is similar to what we've seen in other countries and has led in turn to a weakening in, in people's individual rights. Excellent. Now, just to, to start this conversation, because personal rights, of course, is about political rights, but also personal rights is about those rights that you have to fulfill your, your, your potential. That means also, if you want to, for example, be uh, uh, a businessman, uh, to have the capabilities, the resources to put a, a, a firm or a business. Uh, in some countries where we lost personal rights, people can't, can't start a business uh, easily. Uh, the environment of business actually is not good. So again, some institutional arrangement is affected the economic outputs. Kelsey, you have in, in Data for Good this analysis of a small business. Uh, around the world, and, and you are actually measuring what are the challenges for them, uh, because we are seeing that even in the United States, um, where we, outside of the United States, think that maybe uh, being an entrepreneur is easy, we are seeing those, some challenges also in those units. So even the, the private rights that you have for to be a businessman, well, it's not, it's not easy in the US, and also in the world, it's very complicated. Yeah. So. Um I work at Data for Good at Meta, and we, we do a number of um, data sharing initiatives uh, on, on a number of topics. But one of the things that we often think about kind of approaching this from a data provider perspective is how can we um, share data sets in a privacy preserving way with partners so that they can um, do their work better and have access to resources that otherwise they may not have um, to be able to build uh, healthier and more inclusive societies and communities. And so thinking about, you know, especially as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, which was devastating on so many levels, um, how do we think about, um, you know, recovery from a health perspective, from an economic perspective, um, from so many angles? And so, um, I lead our surveys work, and so we do um, a, a few different surveys, but I'll start with the survey on gender equality, which I think kind of um, nicely illustrates here some of the challenges. And so in, in the COVID-19 pandemic, we can use the, the Facebook platform to administer surveys, and in this case, it was in about 200 countries or so, um, to ask people about um, gender norms, and as well as other things, but trying to understand within household dynamics who was controlling um, financial decisions, who um, was bearing the, the um, largest share of uh, domestic responsibilities, for example. And so, you know, the, the results are sort of what you might imagine and um, sort of it, a lot of people may have lived experience with this, but it's nice to be able to see in the data and actually quantify this so that we then have evidence to be able to take and apply in our policies. And so we see the, you know, especially when um, women are, are sort of disproportionately affected and doing the larger, the, the larger share of um, domestic responsibilities, we see this translate into um, the business environment as well. And so we also do with the World Bank and OECD and other partners um, surveys of small businesses and we see that women-led businesses uh, were significantly more affected and um, in particular thinking about closure rates in uh, of schools and how uh, when schools close, kids are of course at, at home and then women are more likely to be taking care of kids and they aren't, aren't able to run their businesses. Um, and so thinking about some of those things when we're rebuilding from the pandemic, hopefully as we continue to emerge, how do we think about building not just you know, just recovery, but an inclusive recovery. And what are the tools that maybe women-led businesses or minority-led businesses um, need in order to thrive, um, both from sort of the business perspective, but then also, you know, in their day-to-day -day lives as well. It's good that you mentioned about this gender approach, because my next question is about that. Uh, but for you that maybe forgot the, the first workshop, 
one of the indicators that we use to measure personal rights actually is private property for women. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you can see, the problem is not, is very complicated because it's going from institutional level, like political, political rights, but also it goes until the families. Because some of these decisions about the empowerment of women in terms of economics, in terms of having more assets, in, in terms of having economic rights, also is a decision at family level. So we are talking of a complex problem that goes from macro to micro. So it's complicated. Now, how complicated it is for women in terms of their political rights, their personal rights in United States, Mimi? You know, I knew you were going to ask me something like this. And I didn't want to have a totally like dismal answer because I, I think it is a mixed bag. I think on the one hand, in the last several years, we've actually seen a remarkable growth in um, women's power in the United States. And I think that, um, you know, can be measured, of course, by, you know, uh, in, in corporate governance positions, running businesses, um, also in positions of government and politics, which of course I w watch very closely. Um, and the 2018 election in particular was um, just a landmark uh, moment for women in government. So there is some good news. I think the, um, the, the, the bad news though, is I think related uh, very closely to the de decline in our democracy. So. Um, you know, just to take one issue similar to what you guys were just talking about, something like paid family leave, which is wildly popular um, in every survey I've ever seen of voters, and is of course disproportionately important to women because women do a greater uh, carry a greater caregiving burden and has direct economic ramifications when women have to take time off of work or after they've when somebody is sick or um, uh, after childbirth. And the U.S. still fails to have any sort of family leave, family sick policy. And, you know, I think the clearest answer for that is because our democracy is broken and we are therefore failing to translate the will of the majority into actual policy, even though that is what voters want and that makes economic sense and that makes sense from a policy standpoint. Um, you know, the other thing, of course, that it, that bears mentioning is that we are, uh, I, th I think, right at the beginning of um, a severe decline in women's reproductive freedoms in the in the United States. And of course, I'm sure everybody here, um, I think it made uh, international headlines, uh, saw that the U.S. Supreme Court, in a very unusual leak, we learned that they are seriously contemplating overthrowing the constitutional right to have an abortion before, um, um, basically before second trimester. And so what this would mean in practical terms is it would leave it up to each state to, to determine the reproductive rights of, of women. And we have already seen multiple states, including Texas, rush to enact really draconian laws that would, um, many of them, including in Texas, would have no exception um, to the criminalization of abortion, um, possibly for the life of the mother. And so that, of course, again, is um, a severe decline of, of you know, fundamental constitutional rights that I think we're sadly on the precipice of, that is going to get blocked from being um, mitigated or remedied by the political system because of the problems with our democracy. So. You know, I, I would be very interested to hear from Meta and, and other data folks, you know, what sort of economic impact that sort of, um, you know, what we expect to come um, with, with regards to reproductive rights will have, but it is going to be, of course, severe. Sometimes we, when we think about personal rights, we think that we took it as granted. I mean, when, when we are thinking about losing our rights or losing what we have, uh, use to, 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 to fulfill our capabilities. Actually, in Mexico, uh, we are also seeing uh, that women are having some impacts in terms of your rights, in terms of your, their security. And, and Mexico was one of the top countries in Latin America giving security to, to women. But now we are, going, we are going backwards. So also, maybe is there, is there a trend that we need to measure to understand that? I don't know, with the, you also have a survey 
uh, for, for gender in, in around the world. Have you seen some trends uh, that can help us to understand a little bit what's happening with the rights of the women? So I think, you know, expanding a little bit on the survey or that I mentioned earlier, um, it, it was interesting to see, you know, I think we think about, you know, the, the U.S. and, you know, the, the survey was then uh, last year and the year before, so we don't have 2022 data, but it was interesting to see um, that the, the differences in expectations around norms were fairly similar around the world. Um, maybe there would be a slightly higher percentage in certain countries over others, but the trends were very similar. Um, and I think that was illuminating for me because, um, you know, I hadn't, uh, especially thinking about, um, you know, care in the household and um, expectations around finances and choices um, in people's lives. Um, it was, you know, you often think about, um, you know, certain regions of the world where like maybe um, there's more of an expectation uh, in more traditional societies that that would be the case and that would be unexpected um, or expected. But um, it was very, uh, the, the results were fairly similar around the world, including in the United States. And so I will be very interested to see how that changes over time um, and see if maybe we can close some of those gaps or if some of those these recent um, you know, political decisions that have been ma made and some of the new legislation will have um, an awful effect on, on women and maybe that will change both norms and, and the results and, and harms that come out of it. Um, so it will be interesting to see, maybe it will be good to sort of measure that over time and, and try to get a sense of um, you know, quantifying that effect for sure. And one last question, because we're running out of time. But every time I think about personal rights and the challenges that we have in Latin America, uh, I, I, I think about the three P problem. Polarization, uh, populism, and post-true environments that are affecting the quality of our institutions and the democracy. We, we, are, we are living with that in, in Latin America. And, and because of that, maybe we are not ready not only to recover from COVID-19, but also be ready for the next Black Swan event or Green Swan event. We have seen that democracies perform better against those kinds of risks. And, and Mimi, what are your expectations about, about the future of US and, and what works to tackle personal rights uh, or what you are doing in Texas that maybe we can scale it in our place? Yes, I mean, so one thing to remember, and I think that the United States has historically been a model in this regard, is really what we're talking about is not a straight democracy where the majority always gets its way. That we actually, what has been really successful as a governance model is, and I'm using this in like the political science term, liberal democracies, meaning you have strong protections for individual rights in the United, in the United States that primarily comes from our US constitution from our state constitutions and from federal laws. And then you have a robust um, and functional democracy where um, people have equal access and ultimately the preferences, policy preferences of the majority make their way into law. Um, you know, uh, we've talked about a lot of ways that that system is, is broken down right now. I mean, that said, I still have a lot of hope for the future. I do think that we have seen you know, it is, a, it is a volatile time in the United States and across the world. Some of that has to do with problems in our democracy and some of it is things like COVID that are way outside of our control. But one thing that makes me very hopeful is that um, people have not, have not tuned out <laughs> of the democratic process. We have a massive problem of misinformation and lack of civic education, but we are also seeing people protesting in the streets and talking on social media and going to conferences like this. And I mean, I will say, um, you know, my, I've worked on voting rights issues specifically for over a dozen years in the United States. And I was at a rally in Texas last year in over 100 degree heat where we had, I think, 10,000 people in attendance. I never thought I would actually see that for fairly boring, you know, mundane issues of election administration. And so, you know, that gives me a lot of a lot of hope. I, I do believe at the end of the day that the US democracy is badly weakened, but I don't think that it is completely broken. And 
you know, if you forgive me for a second, it possibly sounds a little cheesy, but it is really up to the people of the United States to come together and to fix it. And we've done it again in our history. And so, you know, I, I do have hope. And, um, you know, Martin Luther King's famous saying that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. Hope, yes, we need to have hope, especially when we are seeing these global risks that we have. And when seeing also this three piece problem, uh, I'm thinking what we are doing, for example, in terms of tackling climate change, the post-true the post uh, phenomenon that we are seeing with basic science like vaccines and people that are is, is thinking and still think that if you vaccinate, you are going to have a chip and Bill Gates is going to to track you, uh, or that you are going to have magnetic powers. And, and it's true, you, you can see it on the internet. Uh, it's, it's blowing my mind, because just as we talk in the morning, it's science. We are having doubts about vaccines, but all of us grew with vaccines. So I, I don't know what's happening, uh, but the same happens for complex problems like climate change. And I think that you, in, in Data for Good, are also measuring that to understand those conversations. Yeah, so I think of climate change as just one of the, the largest threats to, to our societies and, and thinking about rights, like it really will rock the foundation of, of all of our societies and, and nations. And so um, we've been doing some work over the last couple of years with the Yale program on climate change communication um, to run surveys to understand just public views on climate change. How do people around the world think about it? What do they know? What do they not know? Um, do they think it's going to harm them personally, either now or maybe in future generations? So trying to get some kind of a baseline understanding of how people think about it, so then we can understand what we need to do from there. And so trying to sort of draw a connection between, you know, the, get this baseline understanding to then action, thinking about what are the messaging campaigns that we can do to um, encourage people to take very tangible actions in their day-to-day -day lives. And so, you know, kind of trying to bridge that gap and take the understanding of, you know, here's where people are, we need to understand what they know, what they don't know, meet them where they are at, and um, figure out the right messaging strategies to be able to reach them, and then be able from there to um, apply that and, and do these broad scale campaigns to sort of understand, um, you know, how we can move the needle on, on concrete actions that people can take. And it could be community mobilizing, it could be, you know, uh, different campaigns within their community, it could be, uh, you know, convincing leaders to take action to address climate change. So it could be a number of things, but um, that's one of the things that I'm really excited about working on is, is really drawing that connection and um, being able to share data in a lot of countries where um, we, we don't yet have a great understanding of how people think about climate change as a concept and then how it's applied and, and affects them in their day-to-day -day lives. You talk about connection. In Social Progress Index, uh, we believe in collaboration and connections. And actually, I want to connect you with you, Mimi, with Kelsey, <laughs> because if you are able to measure this post through in, term, in, in terms of a huge challenge as climate change, mm -hmm. maybe we can do something about personal rights. Maybe we can start exploring some innovative ways to understand what's happening with personal rights. We are running out of time, so two minutes. Uh, so if there are questions, you know how this works. One question, please, microphone over there. Thank you. Hi, how are you? My name's Anne from Philadelphia. Um, I've been really surprised that artificial intelligence hasn't entered this conversation. Um, the misinformation that we're seeing today is nothing more than propaganda. Propaganda has been around for centuries. The difference now in our era is that Meta, other companies are employing artificial intelligence to stoke emotions and rapidly circulate ideas around the world that have no business getting circulated. Before the Russians um, invaded Ukraine, they launched a cyber attack on the, on the physical locations. So the, the municipalities, every institution in Ukraine that was about to be physically attacked was cyber attacked 24 hours in advance. So the role of technology and the gap between 
what Meta is running forward with in technology and artificial intelligence is so far ahead of any congressperson's limited understanding of what is going on. We don't even have an adequate cybersecurity talent strategy in the US. Um, even as we are being attacked daily by Russia and China. Like, this is an issue of national security. Can you please talk about the role of artificial intelligence and our government's inabilities to understand it, let alone regulate? Can, can I it's, just very quick, yeah, sure. ju just to, to say something. During the last months, Costa Rica has been hacked by a Russian group called Can Conti. They are asking for $20 million to return our private data of the health system. Right now, the health system of Costa Rica can't send an email in their local computers. We don't have systems in the health system in Costa Rica. We have problems also with the Ministry of Finances. We have problems also uh, with the Ministry of Science and Technology. We are hijacked by Russia. And we are trying to stop this. The government of the United States is helping us. Remember that Costa Rica has no army, but in Russia, someone declares, declares us a war. And we don't have, not the, the artificial intelligence, the strategic intelligence to protect us against those attacks. Those, just to put some, some context about Latin America. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. And, and I know, um, that this is a common a common question that that I get. Um, to be honest, this is uh, further away from my work, and so um, I'm no expert on artificial intelligence or regulation, and I, I don't know what the right answer is. Um, I do know that we have a lot of teams that are working with regulators to try to. Um, uh, both educate and figure out what the right solutions are. Um, we're really on the forefront of so many things that like, we don't quite know what the right solutions are, and, and it takes a partnership between the company and regulators to figure out you know, what the right balance is. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that other, others at uh, the company would be much better placed to, um, to speak to. Um, for me and other teams that work on the more data sharing side, I know I've spoken about uh, you know, businesses, climate change, et cetera, um, but we're, we're thinking about, and there are other teams that focus a little bit more specifically on polarization and misinformation and other tools that can provide those types of insights to uh, the public or other partners or regulators. Um, we're trying to think about how we can scale some of that work. So it's, it's very hard to create these data sets to be able to share them in a privacy-preserving way. So we're doing a lot of work on, on some issues on my team. Other teams will tackle other issues, but trying to figure out how we can do more of it. Um, and that will also help other um, partners that are outside the, the company hold us accountable and, and push us on things where we need to be pushed. Um, so I think, you know, just something to keep in mind, that there's a lot of work to be done here, and um, we'll continue to try to scale that work for sure. Questions? One more? We still have time. Arturo. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, yesterday we heard uh, something that actually changed the way that I, I want to look at and think about time and gender and leadership, uh, which was this beautiful insight from um, Karen. Karen Joseph, um, about uh, female leadership during chaos, male leadership when there's a, a bear in front of us and we need to kill it. Um, and I just think uh, that we saw during the pandemic that the countries that did the best were led by women. I don't know if that's statistically true or just anecdotal. Uh, how do you how do you take that notion and, and is there any data that could show uh, insights around either how female empowerment can lead to social progress, uh, better models of leadership, or the opposite, which is uh, an attack on female rights leading to ca more chaos and and, and uh, um, dwindling of democracy? 
Mimi? Yes. I have maybe one thought, but Mimi, would you want to take, yeah. Mimi, go. Oh, I was gonna say, you go ahead with the data piece, which I oh, think is the, I, the question. I'll, I'll just start with a, a tidbit. So it, I, I um, one thing that, um, I thought was interesting from one of the more recent surveys that we did of small businesses, which is not, um, you know, exactly this, but I thought was interesting about women-led businesses in particular, was that they had a much higher proportion of, um, or mu much higher rate of having uh, skills training and other sort of leadership programs at their businesses than med-led businesses. And I thought that was just sort of interesting, and I would love to sort of dig in a little bit deeper into why that is, but um, that mentorship, piece I thought was really interesting and worth sort of thinking through, especially in the context of the last couple of days where we've talked a lot about societies and kind of communities and leadership within um, indigenous communities. Um, that was just something that was sort of top of mind for me. Um, Meet me over to you. I mean, I'd love to see some measurement. I mean, it is certainly my personal belief and observation that it seems like the um, countries and within the United States, states that had strong women leadership fared a lot better during this most recent emergency. You know, I do want to go back to something that was said earlier that came out of the metadata, which should um, just be a little bit of a warning sign for us, is that there are really ingrained, um, you know, negative views about women still in the United States. And given the type of work I do, I see that come out the most in surveys of voters who consistently um, think that women politicians are less honest, for, for instance, or think that women uh, leaders are less uh, capable in one way or another. There's still a lot of specific discrimination against women um, being leaders when they have small children. So do you want to just point out that, you know, one way that we need to get there as a society is making sure that we are fighting back against those sorts of negative perceptions, which at least in a democracy, um, end up preventing women from getting to positions of power and being able to have that steady hand um, that I believe is true during the during an emergency. Okay, excellent. More questions? No? Well, then, thank you, Mimi. Un abrazo until thank you Texas. So much. <laughs> and please connect, connect you to. Thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, A pleasure.